think one of the greatest blessings that we have as a church is being able to share our testimony freely in front of others. Jesus Christ, in these letters that we have went through so far, in this letter that we'll go through today, has commended these churches for their testimony. I just wonder how many of you in here have been going to church with other people in here for years and years and have never heard their testimony. It just makes me wonder. As believers of Jesus Christ, we should be standing up shouting for joy every time we get an opportunity to share what He has done for us. And we don't do it. I'm asking you, church, do you want to be commended or do you want to be condemned? Do you want to be commended or do you want to be condemned? You know, Jesus doesn't commend a quiet church. He never has. You know who he does commend? A church that has action. A church that glorifies him. Think about that, folks. You know, quietness almost killed the Quaker church a long time ago. I don't like talking about Quaker history, but I will talk about that. The Quakers got so quiet in their testimony that they almost died out. And it wasn't until they started speaking out boldly again that they started to thrive and live again. Are you alive or are you dead? I would love to think that you're alive. I would love to feel that you're alive. But I'm not the one that you got to convince that of. Jesus Christ is the one that you got to convince that of. So one day, when you're standing before him, we can all answer for that. Have we said enough? Have we glorified him enough? Have we praised him enough? And have we done it amongst our brothers and sisters enough? I can't answer that question. But one day it will be answered. And it will be you who are answering that question. You might ask, was I trying to give you a guilt trip? Yes, I was. I encourage you to act like you love your Savior, Jesus Christ. It should be evident. No one should ever have to pry it out of you. I think this church today Pergamum. This church today, I think it has so much relevance for our culture. Because it says a lot of things in here that uh, identify with our culture. Let me tell you a little bit about Pergamum for a moment. Now some of you, if you're reading the King James or the New King James, you have a different name there. You have Pergamos. All the other translations have Pergamum. Does it mean anything different? Nope. It means the exact same thing. So don't find any despair if uh, they're spelled a little different. They mean the exact same thing. But Pergamos, Pergamum, whichever one you choose to use is fine. But this city, Pergamum, I will, it's the name I'll choose to use, Pergamum, 
This was the capital, capital city of the uh, Roman province of Asia. Now, they had a capital city in Rome itself, but this was the, the capital city for all of Asia. Now, where these cities were located was in Asia Minor, which is what is modern-day Turkey in that area. But this was the Roman province of Asia, so this was a very important city. The name Pergamum means height or elevation, and with good reason. Now, if you want to turn here, this is Revelation chapter 2, 12 through 17. But this, uh, this city, the name means height or elevation. And, you know, sometimes adults are more like children. They like seeing pictures instead of reading words. So I'm going to show you a picture. Now, don't pay attention to the little red dots. Look at the big, the big red circle. Pay attention to that one. Because right here, this is the ancient city of Pergamum. Well, all of this was actually the ancient city, but this right here was probably the most important part. Now, I know you can't tell it here, but that is a tall hill. Everything else around there is relatively flat except for that tall hill. That hill is about 1,000 feet above everything else, so it's, it just looks like a big knot in a flat landscape. So it's very noticeable. It would have been very easy to see as you were coming in whether by land or sea, anywhere, you would have been able to see this magnificent site because on top of this site, uh, in modern day times, there are uh, excavations where they've, uh, the old temples and things like that that were there that once stood. People would have been able to see them from a great distance. It would have been quite a sight. I'll show you again in a moment. That's a little bit closer view. It's a little blurrier, but nonetheless, you can you get the idea. And this is an overhead shot of what it looks like today. If you go on Google Maps, if you have Google Maps, you can pull this right up right here and look at it yourself. But anyway, you see this spot right here. That was a big theater. Looks like that right there. It's pretty steep, isn't it? That's one you don't want to trip when you're going, uh, going down. Because I... Uh, I'm assuming as steep as it is, you won't stop till you hit the bottom. But anyway, this, is a, this was a uh, seating capacity of 10,000. It was right at the, uh, this, uh, this area right here, that roadway down, down there. That was a very special roadway that led up to another temple, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but here's a, another view of it. I think this one come from my professor who went over there, but uh, they were standing there looking at it. Uh, but all the temples, you can see part of them up at the top or whatnot. But it was a, it was a big, amazing complex. It was a uh, pretty spectacular place. Uh, it had a huge library, about a 200,000 volume library. It's pretty impressive for that day and age. It was the second largest library, only to Alexandria and Egypt. And there is uh, some tradition that says that when Pergamum tried to hire one of Alexandria's librarians, that Alexandria cut off their paper supply. And so when they did that, Pergamum had to figure out something else to write on. And so that's when parchment was invented. That's what, that's what tradition says. So if you don't know what parchment is, uh, that was uh, animal skins back in that day. They'd dry them out, stretch them, and use them as paper. In this particular city, the governor was given a uh, very rare authority. We'll talk about that again in a second. And it was, this city was also known for its medical priests. It had a medical school here. And uh, everything that these cities uh, revolved around, like we talked about the last couple weeks, a lot of the things that they did there evolved around their gods. Not a god, but the gods, their gods. And so, again, everything that Jesus said to these people had meaning, it had context for that day and age, but also for today. And so let's get into the word here. Again, we have a very similar opening as we've had to the other the other letters. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now again, this goes back to chapter 1. Remember there was a, in chapter 1, there is a description, a vivid description of, of who Christ is and what he is. And one of the things that it mentions there is about the sword, the two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. Now of course, did that really happen? No. 
No, it didn't. A, a, a real sword didn't actually come out of his mouth. It was a metaphor. Now, this metaphor, to the Romans, the sword meant authority and it meant justice. And so when these words were written, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, John was saying that Jesus is the one who has authority and justice. Now, how did that apply to that day? Now, as I said, the Roman governor there, he had a, he had a very special thing that he could do that other cities could not do. This particular Roman governor, he could carry out executions. He was judge, jury, and executioner. That was the only place in the Roman province where somebody else had that privilege. So, in, the, in this Roman province, this Roman city, he had a special privilege of authority and executing justice. And so John, John being with Jesus, when he was writing these words, I can't help but think, you know, God, this Roman governor thinks he's got authority and justice. But Jesus is the one who has supreme authority and the one who will mete out justice. Verse 13 says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith. There's many suggestions as to what Satan's throne is and, and what it means. I think possibly it probably refers to the big emphasis or the big presence of emperor worship and also to the enormous amount of pagan worship. Now a few of these gods that I would like to highlight because this is important to these cities, also it's important to what Jesus was saying here. The first god, Dionysus. This was the god of wine of celebration, and of fun. Now, it doesn't take a big stretch of the imagination to figure out what adherence to this God did. Now, in Greek mythology, this God, they believe that his father was Zeus and his mother was a mortal, a human. And they had a demigod named Dionysus. Now, who else do we know of that has a father, a father God, and was born of a woman? Jesus. See, the, Jesus didn't just say these words to be saying these words. John had been trained right. John had walked with Jesus, and so when Jesus said these words, John, I'm sure he was remembering, so when John preached, I'm sure he preached these very words. That's what they did back in that day. They'd write a letter and they'd go take that letter, and they'd go to church, 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 and they'd read that letter, they'd preach it. And so John was preaching this letter. It had to be reminiscent of walking around with Jesus and knowing that, no, nah, this, this, this God is a counterfeit. I know the real God. I walked with him. I saw him. Something, is, something else is very similar about this God. This God promised life after death. And he also promised a meaningful life now. Who else does that sound like? Jesus Christ. He also offers life after death, doesn't he? And he also offers a meaningful life now. The difference is, and it's a stark difference, with this God, meaningful life to him and to the people who participated in this particular cult, they would drink wine in excess and do all sorts of evil things. And they believed that once they got to this point, that they, at that point when they were so intoxicated, they believed that they were one with Dionysus. You know, Paul talks about being drunk with the Spirit. I used that one time as a Cinco de Mayo sermon. Everybody was talking about drinking alcohol. I said, let's get drunk on the Spirit. That's what Paul says. They said, they thought that when they got this way that they would be one with Dionysus. They would be one with this God. You know, when we're full of the Holy Spirit, we are one with Jesus. Do you know that? 
If you got the Holy Spirit in you, you got Jesus in you, don't you? You sure do. That's why I said, if you got Jesus in you, why don't you act like it? Jesus wasn't quiet. Jesus didn't walk around with his head looking at the dirt. Just y'all just going by. I ain't got nothing to say. Jesus always praised his Father, and he didn't do it alone. He did it with people around him. He did it in every place he went. He was not quiet, folks. He wanted to glorify his Father in heaven. Folks, what are you supposed to be doing? What am I supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be glorifying our Father in heaven. Are we doing it? I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to tell. But these folks, you can tell. You can tell when they were in their ways. One of the things that they did was after they got like this, they'd go run around acting crazy, acting like a fool. It was obvious to people who they were worshiping at that particular time. You know, it got so bad, they, they, they would get so drunk, and it would, things would get so bad, so immoral, that even the Roman government, as immoral as they were, they actually banned in some parts of the, the Roman province, the Roman Empire, they actually banned it in some places because it was so bad. And if you know anything about Roman history, they were pretty bad. But this was even too bad for them. But people knew who they were worshiping. There was no doubt. This is part of the ruins. That long roadway I showed you a while ago, this goes right to this temple. They would follow this long roadway right to this temple. And when they got in there and did whatever it is that they did, they would come out. And I know you can't see it right here, but that big theater, the bottom steps come right down right above this temple. And when they would come out of here, you know what they did? They'd go straight up, up there. They'd run around and act like a fool but they'd run up there to that temple or that theater and they'd praise their God. They would talk about their God. How many of us are going to go outside these doors today and go out here in our theater and praise our God? Something for us to chew on. The next God, Asclepius. He was the God of healing and of knowledge. Now, Oscalopius, this is where the school of medicine comes in. They had a, a huge school of medicine. Now, some of you may not know this, but we get a lot of our English words from Greek words. This word here, Oscalopius, it means to cut open. I'm not going to tell you the whole story about this, about the Greek mythology, but this, is, this word is where we get the English word scapel. From. So if anybody ever breaks out a scalpel on you at the, at the doctor, now you know where that word comes from. Oscalopius, God of healing, God of knowledge. This was probably the most important temple in the city because people, travelers from all over the world would come and want to know about this God. Now here's, here's some remains. Notice they got a little theater too. So this right here, now this, this temple was a lot bigger than the other one. And they had a massive complex. They had a two-story building that was massive. Most of it is tore down now, but it was huge. And they had an underground tunnel that was, what's 300 meters? It's almost 1,000 feet, isn't it? What'd you say? So it'd be about 1,000 about feet. About 1,000 feet. Well, they had this underground tunnel, 1,000 feet, that went from uh, the entrance all the way to the healing place. Like I said, people from all over the world would come to be treated by the medical priests. But one of the things that they would do is that they would meet with the priest first. And the priest would uh, determine or talk with them and say, you know what, let's... Let's find out if you're eligible to be healed or not. You know, when I was studying for this, it was almost like when I was reading that, it was almost like uh, some, of these, uh, these, these, some of these TV preachers that do, uh, do healing. You know, they, they do a screening. 
They find out, say, you know, let's, let's, see who, let's see who this will work on. If you're really disabled, we don't want you because we know this is not going to work. Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't work because I, I know that God is a God. A, he's a miracle worker. I know that he can heal people. I know that. But I also know a guy who used to work for one of these companies, and he said they would come in, one of these big TV preachers, they would come in and they would practice beforehand faith healing which is why he left, because it convicted him so that they were doing it, just being heretical about it. But anyway, that's what I thought of when I was reading this. That's what they would do. They would screen people to find out if they would be healed or not. Now, one of the tragic things about this particular God and his priests, when they would screen people, if they found someone who was terminally ill, they knew without a shadow of a doubt that they were going to die, they would turn them away. Another very troubling thing that they would do is that if there was a pregnant woman who come in who was very near to giving birth, they would turn her away from treatment because they didn't want to take the chance on a child being born and being stillborn and it giving their God a bad impression. Now I'm going to ask you, what culture tells older folks that you're not valued and also says that the unborn are expendable. What culture is that? That's this culture. They would come and people would come and they would bathe in springs that, that were supposedly blessed by the this God, they would come in and after they, if they got through the screening process, they'd go to this place to be healed and I know uh, uh, William, AJ, I know y'all, y'all might like this, William, wake up. Um, appreciate you, buddy. When they would come in after the screening process, they'd get them, uh, they'd get them tanked up on some sort of drugs or, or alcohol, make them hallucinate. And what they would do is they would leave them in this healing room. Now, you know, they didn't have lights in there. It was dark. It was underground. And so it was dark, but what they'd do is they'd keep snakes in there, poisonous, or uh, non-poisonous snakes in there and let them roam around. And so as they were laying there and these things were slithering around, if one of them touched them, they thought that that was the God himself because this was the serpent God. I know this is real hard to see. The light's real, but if anybody knows anything about astronomy, you can go up and look in the sky and you can find this right here. This is Australopithecus, the serpent bearer. Now, there's a he's holding a serpent here. I know you can't see it. It's, I tried to do this off my phone, but... Uh, if you look up in the sky, you can still see him. But they thought that the God himself came down and touched him and that they were healed. And so they would take these, these visions or whatever it was and they would go to the priest and then the priest would try and uh, figure out from their, from their visions that they had what was wrong with them and what did they need to do to fix it. It all sounds like a bunch of hooey, doesn't it? It does. And you know why? It was a bunch of hooey. But this was the God of healing. But who else does that remind you of? Who else is a God of healing? Jesus Christ, you're right. He was a God of healing. You know, Jesus' second and third miracles were healing people. One of them was a boy who was on the verge of death, or he did die, and he brought him back to life. And that's also part of Oscalopius' Greek mythology. Is that's the reason why they, the Greeks, ancient Greeks, thinks he's there because Zeus struck him, struck him with a lightning bolt because he was starting to bring people to life because he got so good at medicine. But Jesus brought a young boy back to life. And he also, remember the story of the invalid who for 38 years laid beside the pool of Bethesda. He was waiting to see the, the waters move because they thought when the waters moved, they thought the angels would come down and were hovering and they could be healed. But he was an invalid. And so unless he got in the pool, he couldn't be healed. That's what he thought. People wouldn't help him in there. And by the time 
people would come to help him. Other people had already got in there and he thought he missed his blessing. But scholars doing archaeological ev- or work in that area now believe that the temple, that Jesus healed this man, because remember he said, get up and walk. He didn't say try. He said, get up and walk. An invalid for 38 years. Scholars now believe that the temple that this happened at was the temple of Osculopius. The God who couldn't heal, Jesus Christ came in, swooped him up and said, buddy, you're healed. Can't help but think John was there. John would have seen this. John would have said, boys, this God, this God y'all were following around, he's hooey. But I follow the one that can really do this stuff. Then there was Zeus, the God of gods. Hey, don't we know somebody that's Lord of lords? Oh, yes, we do. He's not only the Lord of lords, he's the king of kings. Now, in this particular place, they believe that, could this have been a place where Satan dwelled? A lot of people think that maybe it was the throne of Zeus because he had a huge altar there. People would come and sacrifice. A lot of this is original. They actually took it from the site in Pergamum and it's now in a museum in Germany. In Germany. Does that look pretty big? Let me put some people with it. It's pretty good size, isn't it? Now imagine rolling up on this thing and, and, and this shimmering white marble on the top of this big hill. People would have seen it from miles away. These people, they love their gods and they love to show them off. But as I said, we know the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. One of the other gods, probably the worst one was the Imperial Court because they made emperors out of gods. Do we not do that to people today? Do we not make leaders and these uh, celebrities, do we not make them into gods We do, and we shouldn't, because they do the same thing that these emperors did. They want worship. They want people to worship them. Who do we worship? We worship Jesus Christ. Again, top of this big hill, big, magnificent temples. This was the remains of the Temple of Trajan, one of the emperors. Now, this this would have been, this particular temple would have been built right after John wrote this letter, so people who lived in this area, who were Christians, who received this letter, would have thought about, man, what are they doing when they're building this thing? So the imperial cult was very strong there. Pictures of it. It's beautiful up there, isn't it? Jesus had told them prior to this, he said, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and I think we've, what is Satan's throne? I think it was all that stuff mixed into one because it was obvious that Satan lived there, didn't he? There was a whole lot of evil that lived there. But Jesus said, yet you hold my name fast, and you did not deny my faith. See, Jesus is commending these people, even though they were living in a completely godless culture. They lived in a whole lot more godless culture than we do today. But they did it. Jesus commended them for it. Do we have problems today trying to share our faith? We do. But why? Don't we have the freedom to do that? We do. I don't know if you knew that or not, but we do. We do have the freedom to share our faith. You can share it with your neighbor. You can share it with the person in the pew next to you. You can also share it out here. We have that freedom. Why aren't we doing it? Jesus challenges us. Even in the midst of extreme chaos, we can be faithful to God and not deny his name. 
Jesus goes on to say, Even in the days of Ampetus, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Does it, nobody knows who this guy was. There's nothing in history, there's, there's no archaeological evidence that really suggests who this guy is, where he come from, or whatever. There are some Christian traditions that said that he was the first Christian martyr in Pergamum. And that he was also the bishop of the church in Pergamum. But even though we know absolutely nothing else about this guy, nothing. We know nothing about him. Do you ever feel like sometimes that you may not be anything, that people don't know who you are, that you're just one of billions of people who are roaming around on this earth? Nobody knows who this guy was, but yet Jesus knows his name, and he's been remembered. He's been remembered. And I ask you today, do you want to be remembered? Of course we do. We're selfish like that. We want to be remembered. I think I'm going to make this a part two sermon, because there's a lot more to this. But don't, don't we want to be remembered? People want to be remembered for different things, don't they? Of course they do. Yeah, 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 only the good. We don't want to be remembered for the good stuff. Um, but you know, most, most of our heroes, they have pasts, don't they? Oh, yeah, they do. You know, we all have a past, right? That doesn't make us any less valuable in the eyes of God. It doesn't matter if another soul on this planet ever remembers who we are. Jesus Christ knows exactly who you are. So if you're ever fretting about not being remembered or, you know, that big thing in life, don't worry about it. Because a lot of the people that have been remembered in history have been remembered for the wrong thing. I'd rather be the one person who's remembered for the right thing, and that's my faith in Jesus Christ. And I hope that you would also feel that same way. Church, we have an opportunity to share the gospel every day. We have a, this blessed freedom of religion, and praise God for it. But we're not praising God. I'm going to bring you back to that question. Do you want to be commended or do you want to be condemned? That's your challenge for this week. Think about how much you want to be commended or condemned. Because that's the only way it's going to be. You're either going to be commended by Jesus Christ or you're going to be condemned. Nobody else, to get, there, nobody else ever gets to make a different choice when we're standing in front of him. Don't wait until then. Because at that point, you have no choice. But today, you do. Let us remember that this week. Let's stand for a closing prayer.